Today, let's talk about electrical contracting businesses and starting your own electrical contracting business. So something that y'all are probably going to start seeing me do more often uh, on this channel and my Journey to Master channel, which I'm starting to record more content. Tons of you have been asking for that. I have a whole project that I'm starting that I won't get into now, but you're gonna start hearing a lot more business level content from me. So I figured this would be a good opportunity to just start talking about some of the things that I think a small startup electrical contracting company should consider. So here are some things, my suggestions of ways that you should handle being a brand new company. Number one, work for yourself and buy yourself for a little while. So when you get a new company started up, it's kind of hard to make the phones ring. You got to figure out whose doors to knock on, where to put yourself, what kind of reviews you need, where you need to like go and do stuff to get the phones to ring. There's a whole bunch of different methods to doing this and I think you should do them all. Um, but if you're working by yourself, you are an income earner. The worst thing that you can do is hire an apprentice right away because now you have double the amount of salaries for still the same income. So you're just gonna be running yourself ragged for a really long time if you start with an apprentice. Even if you start with another journeyman, you need to have enough money set aside that you can pay them. And so I think just working by yourself, maybe the first year, maybe the first three months, six months, whatever, till you can save up some money and make sure that you can really afford to hire somebody. Number two is keep a balance in your bank account. I like to keep no less than $10,000. So when I see $10,000 in my business bank account, $10,000 means zero, it means I'm broke. And if you think of your bank account like that, don't see 10 grand and be like, I'm rich, I got all this money. Your bank account is gonna go like this constantly. You might have 10 grand in there and all of a sudden you gotta go buy $5,000 worth of materials to go rough in a house or something. Now you only got five grand in there. What happens if you have three more jobs you gotta buy materials before you get paid? then you're like down to 3,000 and now you don't have any money. That's gonna happen often. So I like to treat 10,000 as my zero and just make sure I got 10 grand in there. And then anything above that is what I try to spend, but I try to make sure that I've got that zero always. And then if I'm gonna hire somebody, I will build more than that 10,000 and make sure that I've got the money to hire them. But I would just treat, as long as you got 10 grand in the bank, you know, you're okay, you can breathe a little bit, but um, again, you're gonna get a check for 5,000 and then all of a sudden have to buy 7,000 materials. And then you're, so you're just gonna see your bank account go crazy. And that's one thing I never really expected when I went into business. Now, if you're doing service work, your bank is probably gonna be a little bit more steady. You're probably not gonna have a whole lot of crazy stuff like that, but it depends. I mean, you could build a 400 amp service and now you gotta go buy $8,000 worth of gear to put that service together. You know, so you, you just don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know what kind of jobs you're gonna take on and everything like that. So making sure that you can pay for all of that is really important. I don't recommend people utilize credit uh, and start putting yourself in debt to run a business. I think as long as you can provide a service and it brings in revenue, I think at first that's the responsible way to go about it. Getting trade lines of credit at the supply house and all that stuff later is fine, but you could also end up with a situation if you still have a low balance in your bank account that you can't pay off the material and then you're gonna have a bad relationship with the supplier. So uh, just make sure I would stay at 10,000 as your zero and kind of build up from that. And once you're, you know, 15, 20 grand, something like that, then you can start thinking like, okay, I'm now I know how the business operates. Now I know seasonally, you know, you've gone through like 12 months of a, of a whole year to figure out seasonally what's going on, material shortages, all that kind of stuff. So um, you, this is another reason for number one, why you wanna work by yourself and for yourself so that you can really fully understand from a business side what the field is because you as a journeyman for the last 10 years, um, you haven't been a business owner, so it's a completely different skill set to shift over into thinking about business, and you need some practice and time doing that. And I think the best way is just keep that table so that ten thousand dollars equals zero in your bank account. Number three, hiring. So I said work by yourself for yourself for a while, right? Um, depending on how much money you're making and what you're doing with your money, what kind of like niche that you're in or anything like that, I think it's a smart idea to save up a certain amount of salary for somebody before hiring them. So for me, if 10,000 is my zero, then I wanna hire somebody, let's say I'm paying them $5,000 a month or whatever, this is a round figure that's probably around 30 bucks an hour. If I'm gonna spend five grand a month, I need to know that I've got three months of that put aside for me to feel comfortable. Because you might hit a lull, something might happen with the economy, whatever, 
another like pandemic happens, something like that. So you need a cushion of money to make sure that even in a lull or when you've got some huge job that you got to spend a bunch of money on, making sure that at least the salary portion you've got set aside. So I would probably build up, if you're paying somebody 5,000 a month, I would, you know, spend, I would take 15 grand. Keep in mind, you also have to pay payroll taxes. So from those of you that don't know, when you pay an employee, right, 20% of their check comes out in taxes and goes to the government, that same 20% you have to pay on top of it. So the government gets double taxed for that one employee's hours. So you're gonna have, you know, uh, if it's like $1,000 a week, that's $200 taken out for them, $200 taken out for you, three months, that's two, four, six, eight. So that's that's uh, another $2,400 that you have to set aside. So 15 grand plus 2,400. But as, as long as you've got their salary put aside and you got about three months, some people disagree, some people are like, no, you need to have six months whatever, whatever you want to do. But at least you've got that set aside so that when, when you bring them on, you don't even have to really touch that money as long as you're bringing in money and everything's fine and you're able to float. Because here's the thing, when you bring in a journeyman, they're a revenue earner. So they're going to be bringing in more money. You know, if you can bring in five grand a week and they can bring in five grand a week, you shouldn't have to touch that money at all. You should be able to pay with your operating expenses. But having that money set aside will allow you to pull from it if you need to. And I think it's just more of a responsible way to go about it. The other thing I mentioned earlier is don't just hire an apprentice as your first hire. I know a lot of people are thinking, okay, I have all this work and I just need help. Really, I just need a hand so that I can do two person jobs and I can charge more money for two person jobs. But unless they're bringing in a bunch of money and you're this small, they're going to cost you so much more than they're ever able to bring in. They can't be left alone. Plus, you're going to be sitting there babysitting, so they're going to take your time and make you take more time for every single thing that you're doing. So bringing an apprentice on, I think, should be down the line when you've got a couple of journeymen and you've, you've got a solid stream of revenue earners that are bringing stuff in so you can afford to bring a helper along and move that helper between whatever jobs need help to have like just an extra hand that can learn along the way. So that's, that's my thoughts about the whole thing. Number four, stick with what you know. Uh, I have done jobs that I probably shouldn't have done and I've had situation, well, really just one situation where I tried to tackle something that was way beyond my scope of knowledge and it was big enough and it got to the point where I had to tell the customer, I was like, look, I bit off more than I could chew with this. I was, I know how to figure out solutions to problems. So there's really nothing I can't do, but it's, some of this was like heavy equipment and like really weird situations and stuff. And I, the people that were supposed to do the underground didn't do things right. So like I had to just figure out all these crazy things that I had never done before. And it just ended up being a nightmare. And rather than the customer being like, oh, this guy's just terrible, doesn't know what he's doing. I was just honest with them. And I was like, look, I bit off more than I can chew. This is a little bit beyond what I know how to do. So I'm sorry for that. But I am gonna find another contractor that's another company that can specifically do this thing. And I'm gonna make sure that I bring somebody in that can help and handle this situation. And they were totally fine with that. And the situation was resolved. I paid them to do this. Had to eat a little bit of the, you know, the revenue. There was no profit. I just lost money on it. But it was was a learning lesson for me when I was when I just got my master license and I was eager and I just wanted to accept every single job out there so this idea like do what you do really well and just stick with that you need to find your niche so if your niche is industrial don't start a residential electrical company you're not going to know anything about codes inspections you're not going to know how to wire houses you're going to do all kinds of crazy stuff the inspector's going to walk into your house and be like bro you know nothing there's no way and then you're gonna have to hire a company to come in and like consult with you on how to wire a house you know what i mean so just stick with what you know it's okay to branch into other things and do a lot of research and try to take on something that's a little bit beyond your scope but you just need to do a lot of due diligence and research to make sure that you're actually doing it correctly and having another group of people around you that you can ask, maybe some other master electricians, some inspectors, things like that, so that you can gather information about like, how, how should I do this? Is this way too beyond what I'm, you know, what I should be doing? In general, if you just stick to what you know and what you're good at, it'll allow you to, to, to grow as a company and you'll be known for that kind of a work and you won't get in any crazy situations where you're working outside of what you know. Number five, find your niche. So if you can pick, rather than taking every call that comes in and trying to do every bit of work and every single thing, pick one niche. 
So if you're gonna be residential new construction, be residential new construction. If you want to handle residential and commercial new construction because you're really great at both of them and you can set your shop up and your people and everything to do that, then do that. If you're industrial only, stick to industrial, like do figure out what your thing is because the electrical industry is so broad. We have people that are doing solars. We have people that are only doing signs their entire career. They've got multiple license, uh, licenses that you can get. You can be a master sign electrician. You can be a journeyman sign electrician. All you ever touch are like uh, pylon signs and monument signs and like signage on buildings and things like that. So just that's a whole career. You could be residential new construction. You could be residential service and troubleshooting, which is not new construction at all. It's way different skill set. Same thing with commercial. You could be commercial new construction, commercial service. You could be industrial new constru uh, construction, industrial service. You could do facility maintenance. You could do uh, data centers where all you're doing dealing with is like a DC and power supply servers, things like that. Um, you could work in like spe very specific types of facilities that have highly specialized skill set. Um, you could work in uh, doing generators, um, you know, backup power, UPS, stuff like that for like small scale operations instead of at data centers and things like that. There's a million different kinds of electricians that you can be. So don't just whatever comes your way, try to tackle it. You're gonna end up doing way more work than you need to for the amount of money that you could otherwise just make by sticking with your thing. So I will turn away a lot of work. So my methodology is I would rather charge a premium price, provide outstanding service so I will get everybody's callbacks and I will get tons of recommendations from people by just being stellar, not being a bottom feeder, trying to do cheap cost cutting and then showing up and really not delivering really well. I want to be higher echelon than that and I want to be known for a thing so I can charge a lot of money for doing that thing. So if I can do three jobs a week to make $10,000 because I'm charging a lot of money, I would rather do that than do 30 jobs a week to make $10,000 and burn myself out and burn all my employees out and everything like that. And the way you can do that is being known for a certain thing and kind of sticking in your field, in your lane, in your niche. And it's definitely okay to hire other people on who have expertise in other things and then you kind of branch out into other things, that's totally fine. But I think picking a niche, especially when you are fresh into this, figuring out what you can do, what you're really good at, charging what you charge so that you can do less work, uh, charging a little bit more maybe to do less work. Um, but it's also okay. When I started my first electrical contracting company, I took every single call, everything, didn't matter what it was. I did so much work I never wanted to touch and I burned myself out and I tried to undercut everybody's pricing. I tried to, like, I just had a problem saying no. I didn't want to say no. I wanted to be the one that when you called, yeah, you can get me out there. It's totally fine. And then I was three months backed up and I had to keep telling people, no, I'm, I'm, I'm out the door for three months. I can't come out there. But they, my, they liked my personality. They liked my kind of like bedside manner or whatever. And I care about people's kids and I play with their dogs. And, you know, like I, when I show up, I show up like a friend sort of. So I'm, I, I'm kind of a lovable dude, I think, as an electrician. So people just like me. They trust me. They know that I'm going to do good work. They know I'm going to be honest. They know I'm always going to show up when I say I am. And I'm, my word actually means something. And that's one thing people love to be able to rely on you and your word means something. And they know no matter what, you're going to handle it. Um, so I, I like I kind of developed a reputation. So like very quickly, I realized like, whoa, A, I'm not charging enough. I'm getting way too much work all the time. So I need to raise my prices. So some people like get turned off by it and they go away. And I need to figure out and stop taking all this crazy stuff and figure out what are the jobs I want to do and take all these advertisements and cut out half the stuff that I'm saying that I would do and just do the things I want to do and charge more money and be like a stellar dude and, and do great work. And I found I'll make the same amount of money, but my hair's not on fire and all my people aren't having to work till like nine o'clock at night because I scheduled this crazy stuff and everything's taking too long and um, you know everything's just on fire all the time. So definitely figure out what your niche is and stick to that at least for a while. Number six, stop using pen and paper for everything. This is 2023. Literally everything you could possibly write down on a piece of paper is in digital form now. You can run your entire company from an app. Everything, all your marketing, all your communications with customers, all your CRM, which is uh, customer resource, customer, customer resource management. What does CRM even stand for? Customer something, <laughs> whatever. But it's uh, it's how you 
take in people's information. So you can run an entire database of every customer you've ever had, their address, how much money they've paid you, every job you've completed. You, there's ways that you can communicate with people so that, uh, you know, like through an app, I can actually communicate and let you know that I'm on the way. For example, something I'm using is this software called Markgate. So if I do service calls, I can put in all of the information that I want to for uh, a customer. I can send invoices through the software. I can give estimates through the software. I can tell the customer that I'm on the way, that the job's complete. I can completely communicate through this entire app and I can run my business through the app and I can track employees. I can offer lines of credit. I can do all this stuff in an app. So like instead of having a calendar on the wall and a pad of paper in your truck and all of these things, handwriting up all of these invoices, use technology. Like again, it's 2023, we have AI now. AI is gonna run the world. There's tons of companies that are operating to allow AI integration into things. But what markets technology does really well is it takes all of the difficult stuff, all of the different crazy pieces, all the problems that we need to solve with all these separate things and it compiles them into one place and you can run your entire business with the software. So if you wanna know more about it, check out the link in the description below for Mark 8, Rad Software, definitely check it out. Number seven, use reviews to your benefit. So a lot of the old school cats don't like having the ads out on, you know, like reviews and stuff like that. They don't like keeping up with it. They don't want the kind of work that comes in and the service calls and the things that come in that are review based. They'd rather have their core group of builders that they deal with and just have a relationship that's based off word of mouth, which is great. Might take you 20 years to develop that to get the kind of business that you want. Reviews, that's how people search for work now. In today's modern world, we use technology, which I just talked about, to say, hey, where's an electrician near me? Boom, pop up results. Those results have reviews. I always sort by top rated. So if I'm in the map view of Google and I see all these companies pop up, I sort by top rated and it gives me the highest reviewed thing. And then I can go in and read reviews and how these people work and everything. So I actually use reviews to hire other people. If I see somebody with like 17 uh, reviews and they have a two star rating, I ain't hiring you. I don't care if you're like triple A electric because you're trying to hack the alphabetic stacking of ranking of things, but you're actually terrible. Like I don't work that way. So I use reviews in my business because I know that it matters to customers. Not because like, oh, I don't want to deal with it. It's just stupid. Well, it's, yeah, there's a lot of things that are stupid, but if you want phone calls and you want business, this is how people search the internet right now. The unfortunate thing that's a little irritating is that companies like Angie Home Services, Home Advisor, stuff like that, House, Yelp, they are so good at SEO that their results will come up before all of the real results from actual people. So like if my electrical contracting company, it's never gonna be first on Google because Angie's is gonna be like top 10 rated electrical contractors near you. And all the people that pay them they SEO push and pump those names in there. So their list is gonna be the most relevant top of the list. And then you got a, you know, Home Advisor is gonna be next and then House is gonna be next and then Yelp is gonna be next. So all these paid lead, lead feed services are gonna have the top ratings and only the companies that work with them are on their site. So you won't even show up unless you're using those sites and you can't out SEO the size of companies that these things are. You could, you could probably, be a mad con a content house of, of you know, like constantly putting stuff out and just outpace them with SEO. But the sheer volume of customers that they all have means that there's always gonna be a money collector that's in between you and your customers. And that pisses me off like no other. But rather than being mad at it and just being like, I'm not gonna do it. No, I'm gonna do it because it's the only way that I can make sure that I'm relevant no matter where they click when a customer is looking for an electrician, everywhere they click, my name is. So that's me gaming the system and just taking the bullet. And even though it pisses me off, I still do it. I don't fight it. I respect it because it's the way things are. And number eight, treat people well. This is huge. I know some old school cats that try to answer phones and they're like, yeah. And it's like, bro, is that a customer? Yeah. You say, yeah. To your customers, answer the phone, be like, hey, so-and-so electric, what can I do for you today? Be like presentable, like this is business, right? This isn't you drinking with your buddies. 
be a nicer version of yourself when you're on the phone with customers, when you're when you go into somebody's house, if it's like an elderly people, understand where they come from. They're probably gonna want you to take your shoes off or they're gonna see you at least taking your shoes off as a sign of respect because that means something to their generation. There's some cultures where also taking your shoes off at the door is respectful. So if you see a pile of shoes at the front door, like outside, and you go up to the door, at least ask, be like, hey, would you like me to take my shoes off to come into your house? And they will love it. They'll be like, yes, the fact that you thought of that, like, thank you so much. You can even say, is it okay? I'm gonna have to keep coming in and out of here and I got all these boots. I don't wanna lace this up and keep undoing this because I'm in and out. Would you be okay if I just put some like booties on and took them off? A lot of them will be like, yeah, that's fine. But the reason that they take their shoes off is because they view their house as like a sanctuary and it's a respectful thing to take shoes off to be in a household. So you just like understanding things, it, it kind of just means caring about people, right? Like not just showing up, like being a filthy dude, running in people's homes. If you're full of grease and stuff like that, go to a gas station, wash yourself up real quick before you go to your next service call. You don't want to show up like a dirt bag. You don't want to like have respect for people when you, when you deal with people. Most of the work I get and the reason why I have so much damn work I don't know what to do with when I'm out doing my thing is that people just love me. <laughs> it's like, and I'm not sitting here trying to be braggadocious or like self, you know, like full of myself. I make it a point to care about people and not pretend that I care, not be out here fronting. Like I really do care about people. When I go to a customer's house, I'm asking them stuff about their life. Like, hey, so what do you do for a living? You know, it, there's a game to it. I'm trying to figure out stuff that I can remember about them. So the next time I do business with them, I can be like, hey, how's your kid? Like you told me he was doing the football thing last time or whatever. And I'm actually listening. I'm not asking a question and then my mind's over here doing other stuff. I'm like talking to them, eye contact, smiling, being like, a, a decent person because you have to think of things not from your perspective. You have to think of things from the customer's perspective. You're this strange person in their house. If a strange person that doesn't talk much is really gruff, is filthy and doesn't want to talk to me is coming in and out of my house and then just hands me a bill and leaves. I will never have that person back ever. But if somebody comes in and they're like, Hey man, how are you doing today? Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. What's your problem? Oh, you know what? Like, I am such an expert at this thing. Like I, you have no problem. I'm going to take care of you. I know what the problem is. Or even if you don't know the problem, be like, you know what? I've never run into that before, but I'm really good at figuring stuff out. And I've got some, you know, let me do a little bit of research and I'll get an answer back to you. Instilling confidence in people when they're sitting here with you coming into their house, most of the time it's kind of a scary thing for customers, not for you who understands trades and is around trades people and gets it. But like even trades people coming to a house is kind of a, a, a scary thing. So like how you show up matters. If you're wearing nice clothing and you're clean and if you've got, you know, like you're really attentive when they're speaking and you care about things and you sit and listen and respect them and think about ways to respect their homes. Even another elderly example, I take my hat off when I go into elderly people's houses. A lot of people from, you know, like my, my parents, parents, my grandparents generation, it's a thing. You don't, you, don't have, you don't wear a cap at a table when you're sitting down to eat dinner. When you're in inside, my grandma used to be like, hey, we don't allow woodpeckers in this house. You know, like take your hat off. It's just a respect thing. So just little things that you can do to try to, to, try to respect people's domicile, the better. Um, don't pretend like you know stuff when you don't. Be honest and say, you know, I actually I have no clue but I, I will find an answer, you know? <laughs> I'm really good at finding stuff out. So uh, let me do a little bit of research and I'll see what I can come up with. But instilling confidence into people is huge. As long as you are constantly showing up and being like a great human outside of your trade and your craft and the things you know and the tools you're wearing, be a great human being with other human beings. They will love you for it because 80% of the people that are showing up, it's obvious they don't care. They're just there for money and you're going to get all the callbacks because they're going to be like, yo, sister, so, so, and so I just met this great human and they're an electrician. I'm going to give them to you because if you ever need an electrician or if they've hired five electricians and you're the one that shows up and you're like super awesome to be around, they're going to always remember you. So when their boss is like, Hey, do you know anybody that's an electrician? They're gonna be like, Oh dude, there's this guy I met. He's such a good electrician, such a good person. Like, Oh my God, you're going to love him. Boom. Get the business. Every person I meet can say that about me. And I just know that about myself. I know I fully give myself to everybody. Any of you that are like followers that have met me in person, 
I'm pretty sure if you ever ask them would agree like this version of myself is the same version I am everywhere, no matter who I meet. If you're a follower and I'm sitting there talking to you and we shake hands and you're talking, I'm asking you about your business and what do you do and what kind of electrician you are. I give a shit. I really give a shit about the people that I'm around. And so I think if you do that, if you kind of mirror that behavior, really show up, really be present, really think about how you're coming off. Um, I think it's really important if you want to continue to get calls and get great word of mouth and get great reviews. So that's all I got for you. Let me know if there's anything I missed. I mean, there's probably 30 other things I should have talked about, but I got to stop this at some point. So love you crazy people. Thank you so much for all the support, for always watching. Leave some comments below. Talk to you soon.